That's going at the beginning. <laughs> Everybody, welcome to another episode of Film Asylum. We are your hosts, Colin Peters here, John Rashetter, and Jeff Manfred. Hey, I remembered it this time. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't hesitate. I know, like I zoned out last time. <laughs> literally, we just got done talking. <sighs> hey, it happens. It was a late night. <laughs> oh my god, technology. <laughs> As you can see, we're all still stuck in quarantine, Skyping new episodes for you guys. But we have some big news. We heard about the Snyder Cut of, uh, I want to say Batman v Superman, but no. <laughs> <laughs> that got its own director's cut. The ultimate cut. Yeah. <laughs> and better than the theatrical cut. <laughs> Imagine that. Imagine. <laughs> so, Jeff ready. You're telling me that I, I'm already starting because seriously, you got the actual cut. You reference shit that is in the half hour that you fucking already cut out, and it's like, oh yeah, by the way, we don't want this movie to flop. You are causing it to flop because you're literally making plot holes so fucking wide you can drive a semi through it. I'm like, you can't fucking make put this out and be like, hey, this is supposed to be a great movie, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, man. <laughs> <sighs> well, the only thing I, the only thing I will say about the ultimate cut is that yes, it does tie in the plot holes that was missing from the original cut, but we still only got like ten minutes of them fighting. Yeah, I wish we could have gotten like an additional ten minutes of them fighting. It's called cool. Batman v Superman. They should fight more. Yeah, one little standoff and then ten minutes and a right. two and a half. An extended cuts a three hour movie, and it's like, what's this? Yeah. Like, at one point, it was almost a political thriller. Like, in the first hour, it's almost like a political oh. thriller, and then it's like this mystery suspense type of story, and then they fight for 10 minutes, and then it's just a big, overblown CGI spectacle. Yeah. Yeah. But you're also looking at, they based that story off of uh, Frank Miller's with Dark Knight Returns. Yeah. That fight is only really, really short, too, so it's roughly about 10 minutes. Because That's true. And that one, spoiler alert, Batman dies pretending he had a heart attack, so Superman wouldn't actually kill him, so that the government thought Batman was dead, too, so he can continue working as Batman. And with that, it's like they should have played that up a little more. I know they were trying to build towards Justice League, but like you said, the movie's called Batman vs. Superman. They could have just called it the Dawn of Justice, and I think we would have been fine with it. And, I, I like that, yeah. Because, it's yeah, it's called Batman vs. Superman, The Dawn of Justice. You could have just cut out the whole Batman vs. Superman and just done Dawn of Justice, and I think we all would have figured it the fuck out. The, uh, and then the ending with it, with um, that shitty Doomsday, man. Uh, didn't even look like him. Doomsday, no. And then, they, and they, well, this, if you saw that second trailer, you pretty much knew the whole movie. When you saw that one trailer, you, you could predict everything that was going to happen, minus, spoiler alert, the moment Superman died. <laughs> oh, and Doomsday was really a, a dead Zod resurrected? Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't really know who's all those ideas, because I know pe there are people that love Zack Snyder, there are people that despise Zack Snyder because he drastically alters things from source material and then there are people that say hey he puts a lot of those great easter eggs and he's a great visual director who puts all that stuff in the movies that most people directors don't i so, think the problem with Zack snyder is and i've heard cody leach say it i believe it was cody leach he said there's a lot of style over substance i think Watchmen was probably one of his more consistent movies where it had great style visual yeah. story like, well, to the point where Watchmen, they say, is actually a better movie than the comic book. 
it's but I mean the the, the source material is great. I remember reading the graphic novel, and I'm I was glued to the pages. Every page I read was just gold. But his movie that I think actually is his best movie is Watchmen. It's a movie that you could say was actually ahead of its time. I I enjoyed that the most. I honestly I thought Three Hundred was overrated. 300 didn't have monsters. <laughs> uh, the, the graphic novel did not have monsters. He, he just said, how can we make this weirder? <laughs> well, you, 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 kinda, you, you kind of already, you, you done that with the immortals, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't really care did. for Sucker Punch. No, Sucker Punch was, ugh, I, I, yeah. No, I didn't like Sucker Punch. <laughs> That was just a straight visual movie. There was no like real storyline to it. It was cool looking, and then like even yeah. if you tried to read into it, there was really I nothing. Know. The twelve year old kid in me loved the trailer for Sucker Punch, <laughs> but then when the adult me saw the movie, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, that's how I can describe it. But honestly, I really enjoyed his Man of Steel. Um, I thought that was actually a really good rendition of. Superman because it kind of changed a little bit. It showed more of what happened prior to him becoming Superman rather than, oh, by the way, he already has all this cool shit and he's Superman. Like, it showed him trying to hide the fact that he was a superpowered, I guess, human until the point that he actually came out as Superman. I enjoyed that. And the fact it showed why Superman doesn't kill anybody, though at the mm -hmm. end he chose to kill Zod over, spoiler, sorry. Over let him kill humans. It made it shows like the development of that character. Yeah, it like, was a necessary evil at the yeah. end. Right, he felt horrible about it, but he had to do it. <laughs> so yeah, that was, it was it was. I'm glad to see Superman actually throw down in that movie. Like he actually fought people compared to the mopey Superman that we got in Superman Returns, who. Did almost nothing. <laughs> there was a lot of jumping around here and there, and they mixed flashbacks with current stuff that yeah. kind of got a little annoying. You know, if they would have told a more consistent story, I think Man of Steel would have been a lot better. But I also like that right off the bat, they didn't hide the fact that Lois didn't know who he was. You know, she pretty much <laughs> figured it out and knows all along, which that was actually refreshing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and that's that's the example of we had our Superman movie and the sequel idea didn't work because it was sort of like a sequel reboot, which was like, why was Superman Returns? And then when they did Man of Steel, it was a lot more like, here's a reboot and we're doing gearing up for our, you know, DC universe. Yeah, that was it. Mm -hmm. That was a good stepping stone. And then when they did. Batman vs. Superman, it was another stepping stone. So those two movies were a good start. It's just when they decided to do Suicide Squad and Justice League and fuck with both of those movies really hardcore, it's they kind of lost their way. Like, yeah. Uh, don't get me wrong, I enjoyed the version of Justice League we got. I'm excited for the Snyder Cut to come out because I want to see what his big differences are. But on the yeah. flop side, I'm afraid that movie's going to suck because there's so much hype for it right now. What if it really does suck and the Joss Whedon version is probably the better version? Great, we got some yeah. really cool sequences out of it. Come on. The whole resurrection of Superman and the jokes about Pet Cemetery. <laughs> really like, it showed how powerful he really is. He fucking took on the whole Justice League as a whole and made them look inferior. And I was like, you got to see Superman's almost full strength. Because, like, he's taking on an Amazonian, um, Atlantean, and then a speedster. I, we're not saying Batman is going to help because, you know, he's human. He has no cool secrets. And a cyborg. <laughs> I'm not even saying. He's, he's a high-powered computer. That's about it. High-powered <laughs> computer. Even in, like, comics, he, he has some cool stuff. They didn't even get to that point in those movies. They're like, by the way, they've got this human-powered computer... Who's going to help out? He's a Dell. Yeah. <laughs> I think he's leaning more towards... <laughs> and like, I thought the one cool 
uh, consistency they used when Superman is starting to get memories back, and he grabs Batman's face, and he picks him up in the air like he's nothing, like a piece of paper, and he starts repeating word for word everything Batman said to him during the fight. Mm-hmm. And Superman, I that I got chills. I'm getting chills right now because I think that's probably like one of the deepest moments. Is like that stayed in his subconscious even after death. That yeah. Batman may have had a point, but yet you're letting this human tell you this. And I was like, damn. Like so those big things that they did in that movie I was surprised with. And then they let it open for like another story, which I feel like it's never gonna happen because WB itself is too much of we want to be like Marvel. And they should not be like Marvel. Too 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 much too fast. That's that was their biggest issue was trying to catch up to ten years when they were on like year three. Yeah, it, it was wasn't going to happen, but they didn't see it that way. Unfortunately, I mean, I thought, I thought they had some pretty good introductions of Aquaman and Flash. Mm-hmm. I did like in the war sequence. Yeah, you brought her in the Justice League. I thought that mm-hmm. worked pretty well. Yeah, it, I I didn't feel like it was I didn't feel like that was too fast. Um, it definitely gave Aquaman a a good story where you had like some flashback um, origin and then it became his own movie. But I sort of felt like watching the first Aquaman that I was like, you know, I think there could be something else that brought him to the people's attention more that let him know. There's something a little more special about him, and then mm-hmm. the plague happens. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, oh, we know him now, but then all of a sudden they take him back to Atlantis, and hey, you're even a king. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I do like how these movies that have came after Justice League that they still manage to tie in just enough that they're still within the same universe. Like the mention of the battle with Steppenwolf in Aquaman, or even with Shazam, the fact that there are newspaper clippings of Superman has risen and, you know, uh, things like that. Like, I'm glad that they still, they're not forgetting what happened. It's still in the same universe. It's just that it's being told through a different lens with a different director. And more focus, I think. Definitely trying to build on own solo movies as opposed to trying to cram everything, shoehorning in all these elements into one movie where things just get blown out of proportion. So with all that being said, I do got to say that I did enjoy Justice League. I actually felt like it got too much hate when it first came out. I do. Yeah, I think that too. Was it great? No. No. I mean, I even left the theater going, I had fun. Mm-hmm. But I didn't feel a rush to see it. It wasn't like when I saw the first Avengers movie. <laughs> <laughs> I think at one point I actually went to the bathroom when I was in the theater and said, oh, I think this is a part I can walk out on. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. And, yeah, <laughs> I had one of those moments. Yeah, one of those moments, <laughs> yeah. Because yeah, um, when it came to Justice League, Zack Snyder was directing the project and then he stepped away and people thought the reason why he had stepped away is because his daughter had tragically committed suicide and so he wasn't able to finish the cut so they brought in Joss Whedon, a guy who knows how to make a movie with a collection of heroes coming together to basically fight off a big evil in the first two Avengers movies so they brought him on. He hired Danny Elfman to compose a score, which I thought was actually a great idea. I could hear subtle elements of Batman's iconic theme from Tim Burton's Batman sprinkled into the moments where Batman shows up. I'm like, oh, that's Danny Elfman bringing you back. Like, I could just hear those subtle movements. I just got giddy. I, I couldn't help but like just get giddy in those moments. And yeah, the movie was it was fine. I didn't think it was a, a good, one of the big issues I had with it was that Steppenwolf didn't really feel like a big threat. He didn't feel very menacing to me. Um, some of my favorite sequences involve when the Justice League come together or even when they're fighting against each other. I wish we had more scenes of them at odds with one another because then we get to see different ideologies clashing where no, we should do this. No, we shouldn't. No, we shouldn't do that. No, we really shouldn't do that. No, maybe we should do this. 
you know, like, I wish we had more of that. And then there was some good camaraderie. I liked the, um, the, um, comedic stuff was, um, uh, Ezra Miller with Ezra Miller. I did like, uh, how he kind of felt like the audience where he was like excited to see everything. Like he, he had the biggest grin on his face whenever he saw like a spaceship, whenever he saw like the bat cave, whenever he saw a new hero, he was just like, Oh my God, so great to meet you. You're amazing. Ah, I love you. <laughs> Or like the fact that he's like, guys, I don't really do combat. I just kind of push people and then run away. That's that's what I do. I can't do this. I, I'm not a hardened badass warrior like like Merman over here. <laughs> but I'm curious what's going to happen with him because he's kind of in hot water right now. Um, I don't know if you heard about what's going on, but there was like some sort of altercation that took place uh, overseas with... Uh, Ezra Miller and a fan, apparently a very clingy fan that he just wanted to get away. And apparently it looked like he was choking somebody, even though this guy couldn't like push a light breeze, a light breeze would push him over easily. But I'm curious what's going to happen with him. Like, is it, is this meaning the dead, the end of the flash movie? Do we have to go back to square one again? I mean, I don't know. So we don't know. We don't know the backstory to that. When we, we don't know the full details. We really don't. But um, it involved too. It could be for their own publication and suing and stuff like that as well. So we don't know. Uh, we don't know. We, we just know what we've seen in the footage and what people have already talked about on YouTube or wherever in their articles. So. And correct me if I'm wrong, but hasn't he been kind of quiet about the Snyder Cut? being released because i know like when they finally said the snyder cut was coming out Affleck, Deville, jason momoa, jason momoa. Mm -hmm. uh, gal gadot i apologize i don't remember the actor who played cyborg ray fisher i remember they all yeah ray fisher thank you mm -hmm. they all posted something about finally the snyder cuts coming and i want to say ezra miller was quiet about it that could be him laying low. Maybe it's him laying low because of what happened. That's that's that might be the case. I have no idea. But yeah, like the biggest supporters were Ben Affleck, Henry Cavill, and Gal Gadot. Like even like because Henry Cavill surprised everybody with a surprise screening of Man of Steel, and he showed up. Zack Snyder brought him on board when they had this Zoom conference meeting, and then the one fan asked the question. When are you going to release the Snyder Cut? And then Zack Snyder says, hey, Henry, what do you think? Should we show it? Yeah, let's show it. And so they said, 2021, it's happening. <laughs> Dude, that's Something awesome. funny about... Oh, go ahead, Jeff. I was just saying, that was awesome. Like, honestly, like I was watched a little bit of that. I met right after that. So I was, like, watching a little bit of them go talk back and forth. Yeah, it was cool hearing it. But, like... Um, we're waiting a long time for this because what that movie came out what was it 2017? Yep, three yeah. years. It'll be four years then. <laughs> We're waiting four years for a cut that has, I guess, been in the works for this long. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I think this was making me nervous because, like, I'm like I said, hype high right now, and it, like I said, it could suck. It could be the worst piece it, you'll ever see. It, it's it's possible. It's possible because. The initial reports with Zack Snyder's original cut is that people kept saying that it was basically so much that it was almost unwatchable, which is why it was crammed down into a two-hour-long movie, because apparently his, his cut's four hours long, and they may only do, like, one-hour segments of this four-hour-long cut on HBO Max, which is going to be streaming May 27th. There's like, are you really going to show a four hour long movie or are you going to do it in segments? So we're not really sure what's going to be happening with that. I mean, it's great that he finally gets his own cut because some directors never get their own cut. Richard Donner had to wait like 30 years before he got the Superman 2 Richard Donner cut. He had to wait years before that even came out because Richard Lester, the other director that came in and basically did his own thing, movie still ended up being good, but Richard Donner's cut was better. It was because it was still 80% of Richard Donner's movie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
So that's great that he gets his own director's cut in four years. Richard Donner had to wait 30 years before he actually got the one he wanted to, to make. <laughs> I'm with Jeff, though. I, am, I feel a little nervous about it myself because, you know, they've had the, the all alternate releases and hell Rob just about every Rob Zombie movie has a theatrical and then a director <laughs> cut and, and then you hear all this hype and Warner Brothers all like oh you know Justice League bombed and you know so here's another Wonder Woman movie that's a success <laughs> so here's a sequel here's Aquaman okay now we're gonna that being can't do anything with Affleck so we're gonna reboot that and but yet it's like we have an extended cut of Suicide Squad. We have extended Batman v Superman, and I was like, "So why is it such a hard thing to get this one going?" <sighs> like, just put it on the fucking Blu-ray and release it. Yeah, you know. Now it, 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 that's why it's like I think there's something up with it because yeah. well, why wouldn't they just release it and say, "Okay, yeah, you guys want it? We'll get, we'll mm-hmm. hear it." No, they're making a fiasco about it. Yeah. Not. A box office fiasco, but yeah. there's definitely some deal if HBO's going to have anything to do with mm-hmm. it. Now, I do think that Justice League, people say it bombed. I don't think it bombed, per se, because people the mentality is that you have to make a billion dollars in order for it to be even close to being a success. That's not true. Yeah, it didn't make, it didn't make that. It made, like, uh, just under $700 million. The movie costs like three hundred million to make. I still don't consider that a bomb. It's probably maybe like just below the even mark, or maybe it just broke even. But that's not good enough because there's nothing left for a sequel. It seems like what's these? I think the thing is that the wrong people were in charge of the DC properties because after Justice League, they were gone. They were like shown the door saying, "You're out, Walter Hamada and crew. You're in." And that's basically what took over with Aquaman, Shazam, Birds of Prey going forward was with Walter Hamada at the helm. And they seem to be liking him a lot more because he's focusing more on solo movies, eventually building up to more team building movies, which hopefully we will get more of in the future. Actually, I'm excited for... I'm excited for uh, Wonder Woman 1984. Yes. Honestly, like, I was surprised with Birds of Prey. Like, all three of us have seen this thing, and the most thing we do talk about is that amazing sandwich. That, that sandwich? I love that sandwich. And honestly, <laughs> I'm, I'm excited just to make one right now. I'm thinking about it again. But <laughs> I, I'm in mean, if you do. I think I will. Maybe a little bit next video. <laughs> <laughs> just, like, put the sandwich right in front of the screen. Just take a giant bite out of it. <laughs> but they... they with those movies, like, all right, so Suicide Squad wasn't as amazing as it could have been because it took 45 minutes to introduce all the characters. Actually, almost an hour. And then by the time they reached that point in the movie, they're like, well, shit, now we've got to end it, so let's fast-track this to a boss fight, which felt like it was forced. So yeah. then they're trying to redeem themselves with Birds of Prey. So now, after introducing all those villains as anti-heroes. You're now going to bring in another set of anti-heroes to kind of take over again. It's like, all right, I see what you guys are doing. I see you guys trying to fix all the problems, which with that movie, I felt like it redeemed Suicide Squad, which, by the way, we're never I'm never going to say anything nice about Jared Leto's Joker. So I'm putting that straight out there. <laughs> but it's like they're, oh. <laughs> they are you, you, you get a head shake from me. That's all I'm going to say. It's just that. <laughs> and it's like, I was excited for Suicide Squad, but I was not excited for Batman vs. Superman. And after seeing Suicide Squad, I was like, what the flying fuck did I just watch? Where Batman vs. Superman, I saw everything that Zack Snyder was doing, and I'm like, that one I hit the bar so low, I could probably trip over it. And mm-hmm. it actually ended up being higher uh, while I was watching it, because I was like, this guy actually did some, like, looked into the stuff. We got to see cool sequences, cool storyline. And yes, both mom's names are Martha. We got that fucking joke, all right? But <laughs> it, it was cool seeing all that stuff. And like when they did Wonder Woman, seeing her for the first time on the big screen was amazing. Like, that was a crowd-pleasing moment. People cheered in the audience when I saw it. 
And I was excited to see what they're moving forward with her. And when she got her own solo film, and now 1984 is coming out, I'm like, there's a lot going forward on this universe that they should continue working with, where, like you said, they're now starting another universe with, what, Robert Pattinson? I'm, and I'm like, listen, we don't need any more Batman. We don't need anybody. Fix the universe that you're already on, and then continue. Mm-hmm. And move forward. Don't yeah. stop. Stepping back three steps and then trying to move yeah. forward. It'll be a little bit longer before the Batman shows uh, comes up on screen just because of COVID nineteen and they're a little bit behind the filming. Suicide Squad, the Suicide Squad, that's in the can. I know that they actually just finished that film. I think like a month before everything happened, before this whole COVID nineteen happened. So the only thing that has to do is just the post and. Maybe possibly reshoots if it has to happen. There was some footage of Margot Robbie like on set, and people were like, "Oh my God, her character's returning again for the Suicide Squad," you know, that's that sort of thing. But um, I heard Wonder Woman 1984 is actually trying to be its own movie, kind of like what Tim Burton did with Batman Returns, where he didn't really want to push the idea that this is a hardcore sequel from what he did in Batman. But there was that time with Vicky Vale saying she couldn't handle being with me as Batman, and then the new love is dressed as Selena Kyle. So, uh, Patty Jenkins' mentality with Wonder Woman 1984 is that it's trying to be its own movie. And it, I mean, I can see that just because it takes place 65, 70 years after the events of World War I. <laughs> so. I'm excited, though. I'm excited for that. Yeah, it looks good. It does. Um, I don't know what to say because of the virus cause and issues. Wasn't this supposed to come out now or soon? Uh, uh, June 1st or June, first week in June is what was supposed to happen. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We got quite a few movies that are anticipated that got pushed back, which is a shame. But, uh, before we move on, I just wanted to say the production budget for Justice League I can't say if this is definite, but I see $300 million. So it might be like give or take a little more, a little less. But that's the roundabout ballpark. Domestically, it made $229 million. Internationally, it made all but 429 And altogether, you're looking at about uh, 658 That's the, That's about right, yeah. So it's not a total bomb from those no. numbers. No, it's not. But, but for a movie like that, it, it should be more grand and bigger, and it wasn't. Because you got all these heroes in one movie. Yeah, so. But it, it, watching the movie and what that was, it, it honestly didn't deserve a billion dollars. I mean, you, no. see, you see all the time where there's a bad movie that's a super success, and you're like, why did this yeah. movie make? this much money and then there's a movie that flies under the radar and becomes this huge cult classic and you're like how mm-hmm. is this gonna make any money or yeah. something you're the numbers and you're like that's a success for this movie this movie should have made way more right i don't like that people have said that birds of prey is a bomb it is not a bomb that movie cost 80 million to make and it made north just north of 200 million yeah when people i've, I've seen reviewers on youtube constantly call why is birds of prey a bomb it is a bomb like no it's not do you know what it takes to make a profit you got the production cost which is 80 million you got that back it takes about maybe double that amount to the marketing cost so basically this movie had to make north of let's say let's be generous 180 million in order to basically generate a profit anything after that is a profit so yes the movie made a profit. It may not be a large profit, but it still made a profit, and it is not considered a bomb. A bomb is when you can't even make back your production budget. That's a bomb. King what? Arthur, Legend of the Sword is a bomb. The Ben-Hur remake was a bomb. John Carter, that was a massive bomb. It didn't even come close to $300 million, the production value. It made, like, not even $100 million, I think, like, in its two weeks. That's a bomb. 
It's like these people who are judging this, judging Birds of Prey, a small scale superhero movie that only cost eighty million when it made north of two hundred million. They think that's a bomb in their mind. It's not. <laughs> its production budget was eighty four five hundred. I see, and in the United States, it made eighty four one fifty eight. Okay. And nationally, it made one hundred seventeen seven hundred, and worldwide, it made two hundred and one. Almost pushing two hundred and two million dollars. That's yeah. not a bomb. That's, That's not, not a bomb. bomb. That's not a bomb. People are idiots. I don't know. Like, <laughs> I think it was just marketing candy, like publicist stuff, to get people to read. But it kind yeah. of kills. It almost makes the not that box office really determines what you should go see and whatnot. But it does kind of hurt people and make them think. Well, is it worth going to see then if it's not doing well? Yeah. Yeah. Now, with all that being said, Snyder Cut and how we're kind of wishy washy on it, and if the differences are actually going to make that big of a deal. uh, One thing that I think we've all agreed with in the past is that when it comes to the animated movies, DC actually does very well with their animated movies. Home release stuff, it's not box office. Type material. Um, did they have one that was in the box office at all? The Killing Joke. That had a limited uh, theatrical release. Yeah, it was just for a day or something. It wasn't this widespread. Okay. okay. I thought maybe that was like for at least a week or like two weeks or so. Okay. Yeah, I think it was just a day. Okay. I'm guessing Mask of the Phantasm might have been the only one, but that was also in the 90s, so... And it wasn't part of the animated universe. It was more of yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah, most of it is um, yeah released released on VOD. I mean, like you said, like DC is really knocking out the park when it comes to its animation because I guess it's just a combination of the, sto- the stories and it's it's a lot of there's a lot of great rich tales because one I'm curious about that I haven't seen is um, I saw Reign of the Superman, but it was Superman Red Sun. Where basically tells the story of what if Kal El crash landed in Russia during the Cold War, and he basically just became like this Russian icon and helped make Russia the ultimate superpower. <laughs> like that's a really cool tale. Like that's like of some crazy alternate universe that I would love to see a live action film of that. Just like one sort of side story. <laughs> yeah, that's what he. But yeah, I can't think of one memorable Marvel animated film. I can't. I don't know, like no titles just stick out in the back of my mind. <laughs> they, they did. <laughs> 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 you gotta look closer than that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For anybody who doesn't know, Jeff's wall, walls in his basement, her you don't know what color his wall is because it's just all Blu-ray <laughs> and posters. Yeah, yeah. As I'm like sitting here, this is probably the closest wall I got, and it's covered in two posters. <laughs> a rack. There's a rack over there, and there's a wall all the way along this way. <laughs> so yeah, but literally, I'm looking at him, and I'm like, I can see. So many like DC animated movies, and I was like, I don't even see one Marvel animated movie. Like, it kind of was like crazy because like I figured one would at least stick out. Like, yeah, yeah. This one, right. This one is the one that no. I I mean, they did do an Iron Man one before the movie. Oh, they did. I, 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 I did not. I did I not hear about called, that. I think it was actually called the Invincible Iron Man, and. It, 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 it was, I don't remember it, but I just remember not liking it because <laughs> it, like, as soon as he had the the incident and then you put the arc reactor in his chest, he already had a basement full of suits. Like, he was preparing for the, yeah. And mm. I thought, what? Oh, they had Avengers animated movies. Okay. I know, yeah, I know they're, yeah. Mm-hmm. I think that's the Ultimate Avengers. So it's like okay. it might have been like an alternate timeline too. 
You know, Ultimate and Avengers are two different storylines. Mm-hmm. It doesn't make yeah. sense. And really, there was nothing memorable about him. Um, the only thing that uh, I took away from all those titles we mentioned, which aren't a lot, was the Captain America origins, because that that came out before mm-hmm. the first Avenger movie. Okay, okay. I wonder what it has to do. Like, maybe it's the voiceover talent that DC has, like, because there are so many favorite voices that capture these iconic characters. Like, you know, not just Kevin Conroy who does Batman or Mark Hamill as the Joker, but I wonder if that has anything to do with it because I, I don't know who does the voices for any of the Marvel characters for their animated movies, but I mean, they don't stick out to me. I mean, maybe I did see one of the Avengers team up movies. Maybe I did see one of them, but I, like, I think it was probably the Ultimate Avengers. I think this, is that was that what it was called, Ultimate Avengers. Yeah, and that was, was the sequel. Probably that one. I think the only one I just thought of, like that, probably really sticks out, is the Hulk versus, um, yeah, Hulk versus Wolverine, Hulk versus uh, Thor, in one movie. But the Hulk versus Wolverine is probably the one that sticks out because it actually includes Deadpool, and hmm. the shit that he says is obviously going to stick out more than what's actually being said in the movie or done. So, yeah, it's kind of bad, though. I'm like, it took me this long, or what, almost an hour in, and I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it, like, even oh, Josh, the voice talent from DC sticks out more, because even on the current animated universe, they have uh, Jerry O'Connor and, um, wow, Rebecca Romaine playing Lois Lane in Superman. So it's like, they already got two bigger names there, and that whole storyline, I think, almost is coming to an end anyway because they just did uh just league dark apocalypse where it ends up leading towards uh flashpoint which if anybody doesn't know that's the reboot of the dc universe so with that they showed so much going on like even dude, that's probably like one of the brutalest animated movies i've watched and i was in shock come on they showed wonder woman getting her arm ripped off oh what the fuck oh man <laughs> yeah, it was like it caught me off guard because it's like how brutal the movie really is. I was like, "Yo, this is an animated movie." I <laughs> getting that it doesn't mean it's always for kids. <laughs> it has the time Wayne Batman in there. Oh my gosh, I'm excited <laughs> to see that. Um, and then like even when they did uh, Death of Superman, showing how brutal the fight was between Doomsday and Superman, um, Reign of the Superman that was the follow up to that movie mm-hmm. showed. The fights between each of those supermen against actually the coming out onslaught of apocalypse that was a good one too i like that one yeah like and then it shows that they can do more with it and the fact that i'm still trying to figure out what marvel animated movies like even like as i'm talking about dc my brain's still going what about <laughs> and yeah. it's hard to compare too because like Marvel's animation hasn't always been the greatest. Like even in the '90s, we had Spider-Man and X-Men. We, mm-hmm. where with DC, we had Batman animated series that we've had a whole episode of talking about that one. That one is an amazing one, to, the hard to go up against. Where the story was consistent. Where Spider-Man and X-Men, the story varied from season to season. It didn't seem like it had the flow. Like towards the end of each of those series, like the show sucked. Like, which mm. most seasons do. Um, don't get me wrong, the last season of Batman animated series, it had some cool little stories, but as a whole, wasn't amazing. So I'm not saying that that is the best thing. Well, yeah, it is the best animated series. But <laughs> uh, the follow-up to it, Batman Begins, Batman Begins, excuse me, <laughs> Batman Beyond is, was a nice follow-up. It showed that Batman does age. It does show, like, someone does take up the mantle, but yet the villains are still consistent. Like you did have the uh, the right the rise of the Joker's or the return of the Joker as that movie. Mm-hmm. So, like the Joker's always going to be a stable point. Harley Quinn is more of a recent one, but she's always going to be part of it. Where the villains in Marvel don't stand out as much. Like yes, you got Magneto, who is probably like one of the most well known villains. Um, more recently, Thanos and Ultron. They make appearances throughout random episodes, but they don't actually stay. But that's, I think, the problem with the two properties, like where DC is based in a reality-based thing, where you've got pe- uh, yeah, people, 
characters that can be killed with human uh, weapons. Where, like, yeah, Superman, yes, he can get killed by a rock, which can actually be man made. Um, I would say even the villains is probably another thing that sticks out. Where, let's say, Bane, for instance, is a dude who takes a superpowered steroid to get what he is. He, yeah, he was a big dude, he could fight. But once that steroid is injected, you get the bigger. So it's like, it's showing that this is more reality based. Marvel, on the other hand, is showing that it is more fantasy based. You've got a lot more mutations. You show the mutation is what it is, but it's not by any means easier to kill these characters. So I'd say, take for instance, Wolverine. He recently just got killed. I mean, literally got killed. And that was probably like within the past five years. And it's hard to say because, like, you've got Magneto, probably hard to kill. Uh, Wolverine's another one. Obviously, Deadpool. It, and it, the list goes on. And it makes it even harder to relate to those characters. Hmm. I'm, I'm not relating That's to point. Batman, yeah. Batman because they're fucking billionaires and I'm never going to reach that point. So it's hard to relate to them. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it's cool to see. Like, it's cool seeing all that stuff come through. But you can relate to what he must go through as a human being if he loses his parents to a mugger. Exactly. Like, yeah, you can take away all that stuff, but mm. you, know, you can put yourself in that situation where you stop and go, whoa, the kid just witnessed his parents die. It's kind of like, remember Batman Arkham Asylum? And he's going through mm-hmm. the hallway and he's hearing the, the scarecrow hallucinations and one of the things was he's sitting at the the police station as a kid and you hear Gordon talking to another cop and they said, yeah, a kid like that, he's going to be fine. He's got all that money. And Gordon's like, he just lost his family. You know, no amount of money is going to change that. Mm. And, and it's true. Like he could like throughout that time growing up, he could have spent thousands to millions of dollars on shrinks and he's still Batman. Yeah. You know, that's relatable. I mean, it, it, it's almost, I don't want to compare it to a soldier with PTSD because that's, um, it kind of like hits a little home for me because I know people with that issue and I don't, I kind of like, don't really like to compare that sort of stuff to it because yeah. it's a serious condition. Uh, but it, I mean, it is a form of post-traumatic stress disorder. That's what it is, yeah. yeah. And but instead of like already being trained and having that mentality like ingrained and like Rambo says, you just don't turn it off. He goes to learn more to try to prevent the, the bullshit that caused the PTSD. Mm-hmm. It could be relatable. It's like a form of retaliation. Yeah. And, and that we can all relate to. I mean, we've yeah. all been upset to the form of like, what do we do? How do we react? So that's where I find Batman really. And, uh, Jeff, you mentioned the point where, um, like, you mentioned that one moment where, like, there's that one animated movie where one woman gets her arm ripped off. I mean, like, there, there's maybe because DC's animated properties geared towards not just not not just like a younger generation, but also adults, where it, it's a wide range of dark as well as it can also be humorous and well as be uplifting. Now, I've not really seen many Marvel animated properties, but are they more kid-friendly? Do they actually appeal to adults? Because I've only really seen the stuff that DC's done, because it seems like adults, kids, any generation can enjoy that stuff. But what about Marvel stuff? Is that is that appealing to just one demograph, or is it for everybody? I, I, don't, I don't know, because I've only seen that one... Avengers Ultimate movie. <laughs> I mean, I'd, say, I, I, I'd say the fans. The more fans, so the, more so the fans. Okay. Yeah, like where Disney took the movies, the live action ones, and geared it more towards family oriented, like general public. Yes, they have elements from the comics in there to uh, keep the comic book fans coming. That's where they geared it towards. Where Warner Brothers and DC. Yes, it's probably the wrong thing, but they've always geared it towards more of the fans than the general public. Yes, they tried it with Justice League, and as you said, it it was a flop. But all the stuff they threw in there for the fans made it what we wanted. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's the problem with Warner Bros. trying to keep up with 
Disney. They should have just done their own thing and not worry about the other. So it's like pretty much shitting in one hand and wanting in the other. It's not going to work out. So yeah. I'm like, don't get me wrong. I enjoy the Marvel movies. But after a while, it seemed to be like they're pumping them out so much. It mm-hmm. was that same almost script. Uh, yeah. was, I'd say outline would be the best way to explain that. Because it was something dramatic and it could be happening for so long they felt the need to break it apart with stupid little jokes. And I'm like, well, it takes away from the moment that you are creating. Yeah. So you knew it was coming. Like, oh, something dramatic is really happening. Funny moment, funny moment, funny moment. Dramatic. No, let this that story arc finish and then do your stupid little shit. And that seems to be the problem where it's like, yes, yeah. it's always interjected in each point to be the smartass, to be funny. Like, I think the most heartfelt moment we had was probably in Homecoming with him and Tom Holland. And that really was, I think, an accident. Because they really, he went to open the door and Tom Holland hugs him. And I'm like, yo, that's probably like one of the most heartfelt moments. And I come to find out, that was an accident. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's, it shows, like, there's a lot of stuff that they could have done with those movies, I feel, was the darkest movie they had was Age of Ultron. And that was probably the lowest movie they had because it was too dark. Interesting. Interesting. Where DC has always been so dark, we've, we're used to that. So I actually enjoy that movie more because they finally took out the stupid little jokes. And mm-hmm. they, they left the story alone and it ended up suffering for it because they wanted the general mass media to uh, yeah. rather than everyone who's already been involved with what's going on. Right. And they were hoping for like this two hour long runtime that it would, it would just be two hours long they would have more screenings per day and hopefully that will increase revenue. That's That was kind of their thinking when they truncated this whole movie down to two hours. I, I really, it, it should have been at least two hours and 15 minutes. Just give us an extra 15 minutes just to tie in a few things and just to make it seem as though we are, it's building up to an epic. Because <laughs> it, it, even with credits, it was two hours long. I'm like, that was, you know, I wanted to be longer. I left the theater like, yeah, I'm, I'm happy. I, of course I enjoyed it, but I, I wanted to be longer. That was just one thing I had. But um, one thing we talked about before is that um, DC, at least some of the other DC movies, they seem to have had their own director's cut, if you will. There really hasn't been any sort of director cut for any Marvel movie. Because I guess their idea, well, because there, there is none. They're just like, what you see in the... Theater is what you get on the DVD, I guess. I, yeah. <laughs> now, we've already mentioned before some of these Marvel movies are the same because a lot of them do feel like the same. I've already mentioned before, I call them conveyor belt films. It felt like a machine just manufactured a movie where it has to have the same like color palette in the background. It has to have the same sort of story beats with humor, with action sequence, more humor, action sequence, more humor, twist, ending. There's a lot of movies in the Marvel can that are just like that. And how are people not noticing this? Some people do it differently, like Captain America the Winter Soldier. That was a breath of fresh air compared to the first movie, even though I enjoyed the first movie. And they just got better and better, as Colin said. The Captain America movies did get better, even though there are these plot holes because this whole franchise is so big. There are bound to be plot holes, and everyone's like, there's a plot hole there, there's a plot hole there, there's a plot hole. And there, there are a ton. Like, the biggest one I can't get over is, um, how is it that Scarlet Witch, she just loses her accent in Age of Ultron? She had a thick Russian accent, and she just kind of, like, threw that out the window as the movies went on. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Or even Black Widow. Like, wasn't she, like, a Russian spy? Yeah. And even, even the trailer, Scarlett Johansson just threw out that Russian accent. Like, I'm not doing this anymore. But your family is. Like, in the trailer for Black Widow, your sister is talking in a Russian accent. Your mother, your father, all these characters still talk in the Russian accent. And this is in the past. And you're not talking in the accent. What is this? <laughs> I remember I was confused when she said in the first Avengers movie, talking to Loki, he goes, uh, uh, oh, uh, I, I, I'm Russian, or I was. And I was like, are you? What? 
I don't know. It, it just feels like, like that whole, you know, because I always said like Disney has no balls because they make like they make kid friendly movies and they they don't have the balls to do an R rated movie. You could be like, well, we own Deadpool. I'm like, well, you don't put the Disney castle all over the 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 logo for that movie. You like say, okay, this production company that's owned by us, you're gonna do that. We're not putting the Disney castle in front of Deadpool, showing the middle finger to everybody. <laughs> That would be amazing. They should do that. <laughs> they should do that. But will they do it? No. <laughs> because, like I said, Disney has no balls to do hardcore shit. They don't. <laughs> Sony was kind of stepping up their Marvel property. Like, was that? went darker. I mean, they didn't really get too into the violence. I'm hoping they are now because they're bringing Carnage into the... the you kind of have to. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you kind of have to like introduce Carnage with a movie with Carnage. <laughs> also, Morbius that kind of has some really dark horror theme, you know. Mm -hmm. To it, I actually I'm not gonna say I, I was indifferent when I heard the news about it, especially because Jared Leto doesn't do a damn thing for me. I mean, regardless of his shitty Joker. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I don't see the big deal with the guy, just like Leonardo DiCaprio. I'm like, I don't understand what everybody just has to bow down and kiss their feet over. But um, when I saw the trailer for Morbius, I actually was like, oh, wow, that's a lot better than what I thought it was going to turn out to be. At least mm -hmm. the trailer appeared that way. Trailers are misleading. <laughs> They're very misleading. <laughs> now, but it, it, it came off more impressive than what i was expecting so okay yeah got to do them for that at least mm. in a ten i did like the music choice but then again like you can have an awesome music choice for a trailer and then you see the actual movie and it sucks like they were playing bohemian rhapsody in the second trailer for suicide squad I'm like oh my god yes oh my god this is going to be like the best freaking movie ever and i never want to see it again <laughs> <laughs> i mean I guess for the Morbius trailer, like, I don't mind the look, the image that we got at the very end before the title screen Morbius came on. I I've never really known too much about Morbius the Living Vampire. I, I was kind of hoping, like, maybe, like, a shot or two or him, like, just seeing some blood. Seeing some, like, some, like, real, like, hardcore vampire shit, even if it was just, like, for, like, a second or two. You just get that look over the shoulder and that's it. I was like, uh, okay. I mean... All right. I mean, th th that's like that's how I thought after I saw the first trailer. I'm like, okay, okay, cool. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I'm indifferent. Kind of like how we're indifferent about, oh, Zack Snyder cut. Please be good, but don't overdo it. I don't know. Like we're excited, but we're this we're nervous at the same time. <laughs> you know, it's one of those things. Yeah. yeah. Honestly, I think the best thing that Sony has done is actually worked with Marvel to do Spider-Man. For, mm -hmm. for one thing, I hate Spider-Man as a character. Like, don't get me wrong, like, everyone's going to be like, oh no, he's a book. No, no. I'm just say, well, he is a fucking loser in the comics. He loses his wife because, you know, he chooses to be Spider-Man over everything. He loses everything because of it. And ultimately, he doesn't grow as a character. You guess... Spider-Man is a cool character, but Peter Parker as a character is the fucking loser. Where I'm hoping that with Sony doing it the way they've been doing it, that they actually develop Peter Parker and Spider-Man as the same and move forward. Where I didn't even want to watch fucking Homecoming because I hate Spider-Man. But <laughs> these two fine gentlemen kept talking about how great Michael fucking Ken Keaton was as Vulture. And I'm like, Man, fucking Batman's in this. Now I gotta watch this. So I'm like, all right, I'll give it a shot. I enjoyed it more than I probably would have ever enjoyed it. And mm -hmm. I'm like, Michael Keaton really stood out with that role. And I'm like, so um, what? Are, I hope the next one doesn't suck. <laughs> 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 it took me like what, almost a week to tell you guys I watched it and enjoyed it. <laughs> That's funny. I feel like. We've gotten a lot of Spider-Man overload 
Like there, it, it feels like there's now. I'm gonna say this right now. If we never got the Amazing Spider-Man one or two, or Homecoming and Far From Home, and we just got Spider-Man into the Spider Verse, I would be totally okay with that. If we just had Spider-Man into the Spider Verse, I would be like, yes, great. This this makes up for Spider-Man three. I'm content. But now it feels like Spider-Man is fucking everywhere. There have been like six or seven Spider-Man movies with not even ten years. That's insane. Can we please get other characters to get moments of shining and not just Spider-Man? <laughs> I don't know. Just like, I'm serious. Like, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse was a like a breath of fresh air. I thought it was better than Homecoming. I thought it was better than Far From Home because it, it felt like it told a different story and took more risks. Everything, I mean, that whole movie itself is better than both Spider, The Amazing Spider-Man 1 and 2 combined. It, it really is. <laughs> like, but I just feel like we've got a Spider-Man overload, and it's too much. Unless you're a diehard Spider-Man fan, more power to you. Me, this is too much. Can we, can we like, I, I don't need all this. <laughs> uh, I'm actually a big Spider-Man fan, and I think... Uh, Nerd! <laughs> And I think, you know, like you said, John, it did go a little overboard with it. And I think it was actually worse during the Sam Raimi year just because they cranked out so much merchandise and redid the 60s cartoon, the 90s cartoon, some other cartoon. And he, he, they kind of peaked with Spider-Man 2. They did. You had, you had one and two that were really good and then three where there was... Studio interference. Sony. <laughs> <laughs> and they, he, like, Sam Raimi didn't want Venom and all this other stuff that we could get into more. And that was a total disaster, which it was. And then I, I felt like when Amazing Spider Man came out, they should have gone beyond high school, as I felt like Andrew Garfield was the Peter Parker that, like, could have teamed up with Venom. He was mm. he seemed more adult, you know, he seemed more like he could be with Mary Jane and they kept him in high school until Spider-Man 2 and, and Amazing yeah. Spider-Man 2 came out. And that was, I, I'm not going to say it was as bad as Spider-Man 3, but um, I think they tried to go a little more of like there was mute, too many mutated villains and not. And some in costumes, but there, there was no development with it at the end of it. But um, I do agree with you that Into the Spider Verse is probably like one of the best, if not the best, Spider-Man movie out there. Mm -hmm. um, when you said if we would have just got that after Spider-Man Three, I think we should still have a, a live-action movie to rectify Spider-Man Three. And honestly, okay. what um, I think they're lacking. Because, like Jeff was saying, he doesn't progress. Because they keep on putting him in fucking high school again. Yeah. There is a point of progression where Peter Parker does progress. And yeah. he he grows up. He is like, oh shit, I am nerdy. You yeah. know, I'm going to dress nicer. I will go to the gym. And, mm -hmm. you know, then you get, like, even... Like, he he's not afraid to be more hands-on. And then you can bring in all these other weird characters and have these crossovers and then they can branch out because Spider-Man can do that. Mm -hmm. and he can be that character that amplifies other characters, but they're not doing that. Yeah. I mean, Justice League's kind of been what's done it for Marvel movies lately, but in the comics, that was Spider-Man's thing, especially during the 90s. And then when he had Venom and then Venom was like spawning this other character and that other character. And I thought, when we got our Venom movie, I was saying for myself that if they're going to have anything to do with Spider-Man, they need to leave Tom Holland out of it, do their own. He'll bring back Andrew Garfield and put him into that Venom universe. And he kind of feels like he would fit in that universe, Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man. But they won't because they put Michael Keaton in the Morbius trailer. Mm -hmm. So they're going to keep it tied in with um, yeah. Me. Yeah. I'm gonna say that it is an amazing movie. 
I have a feeling they're going to end up doing it as a live action with Tom Holland, but they should bring in Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire to play two other universes. Yeah. <laughs> it shows that all three universes have happened, and it rectifies everything that has happened with them. So they can kind of give a follow-up what happened to Tommy McGuire's universe, which I want him to play the fat Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> and it would actually give a follow-up to what happened to Andrew Garfield's universe. So we don't get the closure to each of those storylines or universes, but they ultimately just jump to the next Spider-Man like, hey, fuck this one. Let's go to that one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've yeah. also been saying for years since Todd McFarlane's art's been synonymous with Spider-Man. I mean, it's what he did before Venom. It's a very unique Spider-Man look. I think actually his art for Spider-Man is better than Spawn. But um, I'm thinking what they should do is let there be a Todd McFarlane influenced Spider-Man animated movie and let that be rated our balls to the wall. Okay. Because that was that was some awesome stuff. Nice. Do that. Nice. Will they ever? Who knows? Never Maybe his. Yeah, never seen that. Maybe a Spawn movie will eventually happen. An R-rated Spawn movie. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I mean, Joker was successful, and that was kind of like, that kind of like got him reinvigorated, saying, well, because of that success, R-rated movies can, in comic book form, can be successful, so give my Spawn another look. <laughs> but, but listen, that was not a real Joker movie. <laughs> We had this discussion. <laughs> we're not going. We're not going Three back to this. Ago, Three months ago, we had this discussion. You're still sucking their dicks. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Look, we have our own opinions. We've already talked about that movie. We're not going to go any further. I'm just bringing up something that was said no, you in source. I'm just saying something that was brought up in an article somewhere across the internet. <laughs> You do have a point. It was a well-made movie, too, but... No. I, fuck that movie. <laughs> no, no, fuck you. <laughs> Watch The Killing Joke. Just skip the first 20 minutes. <laughs> hey, it's, hey, it's called Batgirl, The Killing Joke. <laughs> as much as I like seeing Batgirl, I'm like, yeah, this 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 is not part of The Killing Joke at all. Just just start the movie off where it's supposed to in the in the graphic novel. <laughs> what 20 minutes in 20 minutes in yeah because yeah it, it really is at one point batman batgirl the killing joke that's what the title should have been i mean we could have a whole episode on that killing joke animated movie but yeah if you're gonna have an additional 20 minutes to that story because killing joke is a joker origin story pretty much mm-hmm why wouldn't you have something of the Joker that leads up to him being captured instead and bringing up past stuff to make Batman go, you know what, now that he's captured, now I got to go talk with him because it's going to come to death. No, you have this 20-minute bullshit story of Batgirl in a relationship with Batman. Mm-hmm. Like, fuck, have her help him catch her, capture the Joker, and that's why he goes to the apartment and sh- shoots Barbara. You know, but no, because you have that that stupid short, and then it goes right into the killing joke, and it's like this feels like two totally separate things. It was two totally separate things. Oh yeah, <laughs> and they didn't. I'm like, yeah, I don't know. Straight up fucks Batman, though. She straight up fucks Batman. She man. does. She oh, yeah. does. <laughs> On <a> rooftop. Spoiler <laughs> alert. <laughs> I, I know I'm going to say, like, oh, we're getting to some territory right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking awkward, though. Uh-huh. I don't remember this in The Killing Joke at all. <laughs> oh, oh man. Off, like, 20 minutes in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Well, wrapping up this episode, uh, we're going to mention real quick the TV shows that we've gotten throughout the years between Marvel and DC. Some have been you know, cultural cultural icons and others pretty forgettable. I'm just saying, Adam West 
fucking Batman is still number one. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care if anybody thinks it's cheesy. It's <sighs> one of the most amazing shows ever. Shark repellent. Yeah. <sighs> Dude, the jokes and everything can be used today. Like, mm-hmm. Recently, I sent these guys the video for a Harley Quinn show where they actually use shark repellent. That's brilliant. Um, that was yeah. brilliant. <laughs> I still love that show. I think the costumes and the acting and the props, that was a, a live Batman comic come to life. And oh man, there's just so much about that show that I think doesn't get talked about that makes it great. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, from, like I said, the props, the costumes, the actors, it it was awesome. That Adam West yeah. Batman show was fucking phenomenal. And it's no wonder it still has legs because that, that shit's classic for me. <laughs> I have so much fun when I watch it. It does get a little repetitive because it is the same stuff over and over again. So I don't recommend watching it. Like, uh, you do need a break from it, but... Yeah. <laughs> Dude, Vincent Price was the executor. No, he was egg- Egghead. Egghead, sorry, exit. <laughs> but he definitely used all those egg puns in that short span of time. That was brilliant. Exactly. exactly. Oh, get the fuck out. Wasn't Excellent. <laughs> Honestly, was it, what, five years ago when they put out that box set? I was ecstatic to actually be able to watch it all again. Wait, and you weren't exquisite? Oh, Dude, I'm going to choke you. <laughs> like, straight up, exactly going to choke you. <laughs> Extraordinary. <laughs> that's but, it. That's it. It's happening. <laughs> but by far, I think Julie Newmar is probably the best Catwoman that ever is. No... No way. I'm just like say that it's probably one of the best Catwoman. Like Michelle Pfeiffer was amazing. I love her. Julie Newmar stands out more because she, it was her character. She owned that character and <laughs> I know. Dude, you're right. She just I took your remember, breath away. I still remember Jeff didn't know too much about the show. And I actually had bootleg copies of it on DVD because it wasn't released yet at the time. And I, I told him, I said, yo, wait until you see Julie Newmar. And he didn't know who Julie Newmar was. And, and, and then later on, we're, he's talking to me and he goes, yo, Julie Newmar is really sexy. <laughs> <I'm> like, <"Dude." laughs> and, and that's that character. That's just like Adam, like you can't imagine if there's two people from that show that you can't imagine, like anybody else doing. It's those two, Adam West and Julie Newmar. I mean, to me, that's the heart and soul of um, two actors that you just can't replace. And, and it showed when they did replace Julie Newmar. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, not that I didn't like Eartha Kid or. Um, Lee Merriweather, but that, I mean, Catwoman's Julie, hands down. So people just are the character, and that was her. I'll have to check her out now. <laughs> Wait, what? You- uh, no, 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 I, ha- I have. I'm just. I have to strangle you next. <laughs> <laughs> It's been a while, but no, I do enjoy her rendition. I think because I was, yeah, I think it's just because like I was like on a Tim Burton craze lately, and like one of the recent movies I saw was Batman Returns. I'm just like, oh, Michelle Pfeiffer, yes, you're crushing it. I love you. <laughs> yeah, put it this way: the first movie, well, first movie, first thing we watched on my TV upstairs when we first got it was '60s Batman. And mm-hmm. <laughs> That's great. Oh my god. The theme, the theme song, the onomatopoeia, Batman words, just lighting up a screen. Pow! Kabam! It's great stuff. You also These, got the 60s, okay. there were the three Bs. There were Bond, the Beatles, and Batman. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, shitty Spider Man, but no one really. <laughs> Well, we, we can get we can get to that in a little bit. <laughs> was that the 60s? 
thought that was the seventies. I don't know. I don't know. It was all like one big drug trip of a show. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Colin. Meth is a hell of a drug. <laughs> Seems pretty forgettable anyway. Yeah. 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 Honestly, I just learned about it recently while watching the toys that made us. And I think it was during the uh, Power Rangers episode. They were talking about Stan Lee working on that. I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> It's, it's not good. It looks, it looks horribly amazing. Like I feel the need to watch it, but am I going to watch it? Absolutely not. No, I don't, you don't need to see it. Even out of everything that Marvel has done as TV shows, I think the only thing that really sticks out is probably Lou Ferrigno's <laughs> show, and that's mm-hmm. another thing that gets really repetitive. Like, oh no, Bruce Banner have those up to help these people. Oh shit, here comes Lou Ferrigno. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was a fun watch. Like it, I remember, yeah. like obviously I wasn't old enough to watch it while it was live on TV, but mm-hmm. I was watching the reruns on Sci-Fi whenever the hell they would play them, and it was always a fun show. Like, I would say the same thing would have been uh, Wonder Woman. That was another show that obviously not alive <laughs> while it was happening. But watching it on the Carter, and she's another one that I was surprised with. Like I. Only two people that we know of that played Wonder Woman live action is Linda Carter and Gal Gadot, and it's yeah. let's see. I would I would have hoped to see a cameo from her in at least one Wonder Woman movie, but English. yeah, I mean it, it's you know that'd be great, but I don't know. It may happen. It may not happen. They tried to get her in the first movie, I think, but I think scheduling didn't really work out. But honestly, like it's. I'm okay if she is or isn't in a cameo of the movie. But, I mean, just like, because we've seen unnecessary cameos happen in other movies. <laughs> Ghostbusters. Mm. Oh, man. So. <laughs> so true. You know I'm right. <laughs> let's, ha- let's, let's disrespect Ernie Hudson and have him appear in the last... Oh. Minute of the movie. Yeah, <sighs> yeah. We'd save that for another time. Man. Yeah, that's 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 another time. I, I've already opened a can of worms. I'm sorry. <laughs> you just want me to yell. <laughs> I do. <laughs> well, 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 Jeff, will I like you when you're angry? Are you gonna turn into? <laughs> Are you gonna turn into a big giant green rage monster? <laughs> no, a bald redheaded red skin dude. I'm just all oh, happy. <laughs> Get really loud. I turn red, and that's about it. <laughs> going. What'd you like better, the old George Reeves Superman, uh, uh, Smallville, or Lois and Clark? Listen, I will end this right fucking. You <laughs> <laughs> hear me see a blank wall and some screaming in the background? Then people are gonna think my house is haunted. <laughs> I forgot about George Reeves Superman, but that was oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> you, you bring up Smallville and Lois and Clark? You know what? Fuck you, dude. <laughs> These are the worst fucking shows. Don't get me wrong. I watched Smallville because, you know, I was a, a teenager at the time, so I didn't know any better. Fu- fuck. But Lois and Clark? I remember trying to watch that bar- fucking bullshit. <laughs> Oh, you're, you don't like Dean Kane? <laughs> wow! <laughs> yeah. Boy, I can't wait till Comic Con reopens and Dean Kane's at one. <laughs> Dude, I'm gonna fuck, fuck you both. I'm gonna go over there and pretty much say, fuck you, you're not Superman. Get the fuck out. Fucking horrible fucking. I hope you wear a, I hope you wear a Batman shirt when you see him. I feel like you wear a Superman shirt and still say this shit. I can't breathe. <laughs> oh, I, dude, I totally forgot about Lois and Clark. Even while we were talking about this, <laughs> oh, I literally god. just. Oh my god! <laughs> You're busy worrying about Adam West. Now we got this to worry about. Oh. 
Yeah, there's a there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of good shows out there, the live action. Then there's some that are just not good. I mean, we talked about some DC properties. I mean, look at what I mean. Marvel had some success with um, the Netflix shows. I mean, I I mean, Jeff, I disagree. I like Daredevil so much. I like all the seasons of Daredevil was great, and then it was on a hot streak. I even like Jessica Jones quite a bit. Like I thought Jessica Jones was actually like um, Kristen Ritter. I think she was born to play that character, Jessica Jones. I, I I mean, I know, like, the third season was good, but it kind of went off the rails because at that point, the Marvel brand was already being pushed out the door from Netflix, so the quality had to suffer. I couldn't give two shits about Iron Fist. I thought the entire first season was boring, and the only reason why I treaded through it is just so I could prepare for the def- the Defenders. That's the only reason, just to tread through it, just to get to the Defenders. And now, like, once that happened, even though it was kind of successful, people were like, nah, we're, we're losing interest. Because <laughs> they didn't even greenlit the second season. They are like, no, nah, not going to happen. I'm sorry. The team-up was cool, but no. <laughs> it was kind of like one of those moments. Punisher, season one. Most of it was boring until the final end when we finally got to see the Punisher do some punishing. <laughs> like, like he actually started to do something in the last, like, what, four episodes? And their idea of Jigsaw, I, I have not seen the second season, but I saw some, like, leaked photos, l- leaked photos of Jigsaw, like, getting oh. ready in season two. He didn't even look like he had any kind of scarring or anything on his face. He looked like... It's like the like the actor was contractually obligated saying, no, no, that's too much scarring. No, limit it. I want to see this. <laughs> Horrible. Horrible, yeah. And then, you know, and then, like, on, you know, cable television, you got Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. I've never seen an episode of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. I know, like, Chris Hemsworth appeared as Thor in, like, one episode, didn't he? I think he did. I don't know. The Agent Carter show was not very good. I it did. I mean, as gorgeous as that actress is, it just didn't generate any attention at all. <laughs> Ailey Atwell. Ailey Atwell. That's her name. Sorry. You know, attractive woman. Very attractive. <laughs> but, um... Yeah, like, both DC and Marvel, they have their hits and they have their misses, but, like... Sorry. Yeah, they do. They do. <laughs> I kind of like in the early days. We we're talking about the early days. It's like DC was coming, becoming a household name with the first two Superman movies and the first two Batman movies. But then Marvel was like, "Hey, we we kind of exist over here." Oh wait a minute. There's oh no. There's Captain America, the 1990 version, and then there's the Fantastic oh. Four movies. Never mind. We're gonna we're gonna stop talking right now. <laughs> Hold on, hold on. You forgot the Dolph Lundgren Punisher movie. I'm just saying. I forgot oh. the Dolph Lundgren Punisher. Oh, oh my god. Oh, I forgot about that one. Exactly. <laughs> I think he. I think Dolph Lundgren forgot about that movie too. But if you notice the the Blu-ray, he finally has a skull as like a little patch on his jacket. And it's the Thomas James call. Weak. Weak. Hold on. You put that movie on Blu-ray? <laughs> I just put it on Blu-ray. <laughs> I feel like they need to waste money because that's how you waste money. Yeah. Hey, when they got China back, it'll why not? <laughs> <laughs> Major market. Oh. Yeah. Do you guys have a favorite TV show of the ones that we mentioned? Like a top three or whichever? Yeah, I honestly, I live without them. Yeah. I don't have any need or desire to. Um, Batman, the animated series, of course, I can't live without. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's an animated cartoon show, not a live show. But, um, yeah, yeah. Adam West, Batman, and Linda Carter's Wonder Woman are the only two that really stick out. Um, I'd say 
honestly check out the Arrowverse because they all all the seasons started out really amazing and then kind mm-hmm. of shitty over time. But no. yeah, really nothing like noteworthy after wow the seventies, which is yeah. kind of a hard pill to swallow. Yeah, like animated series for Batman. Like then you had Batman Beyond and then the Justice League cartoon. And then the boring Superman cartoon. No, okay. I know uh, we, we've yeah you know, we've talked to death about Adam West Batman. It's it's great. I love it. But I'm gonna throw in some two new ones. I'm you know like I said, um, you know I've already talked about Daredevil and how I, I enjoyed that season on on Netflix. But also in terms of DC live action, I love Doom Patrol. That's on the DC streaming service. It's now going to HBO Max. That is like some of the most zany, wild, bizarre out there filmmaking and it was like that thing where like i couldn't look away i had to just keep watching what i was getting invested in even though this story is so zany it's almost like doctor who met the dc properties and doom patrol these are the most memorable characters but i love the cast i like the fact that brendan fraser plays a robot (laughs) and you know you, you got you know, an ex-Bond actor in Timothy Dalton playing the Chief. I mean, he's awesome. He's great in this character. I also like, um, oh my god, Matt Boomer. He's in, he's in the show as well. He's a great character. I mean, the characters are so well-realized, and it's so zany and so different that I'm excited for season two. And it's supposed to be landing on the HBO, um, HBO Max streaming service, which I'm excited about. And you know, we, um, we talked about TV shows. I'm going to throw in a recommendation. If you ever want to go revisit an old video game, we talked about Punisher, but check out The Punisher 2004, that video game, where Tom Jane lends his voice as The Punisher. People think he just did the one movie and then did Dirty Laundry. No, he voiced his his acting talent in The Punisher video game. It is some of the most gruesome kills that you can do when you do, like, hand-to-hand combat sequences. I mean, just the levels are fun. You got, like, a little bit of characters thrown in there. Black Widow's in there. Iron Man, uh, Kingpin, Jigsaw. They throw all these in a kind of fun, exciting storyline that kind of makes sense in a way. And uh, I remember just burning through the disc for hours and hours and hours. I think I still own it, too. Even though I don't play PS2 anymore. Who does? It's an antique right now. But it's it, you, you still have PS2? <laughs> Uh, the Thing game. The Thing game. <laughs> and uh, I think uh, some Evil Dead, obviously horror games. But... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the drawer just has to be pulled open and closed. <laughs> oh, man. But if you're talking about video games, I would say there's a lot out there, like, uh, the Arkham series with uh, mm-hmm. Kevin Conroy and um, Mark Hamill doing their voices of Batman and Joker. That's always a really good one. Um, the Injustice video games, which are pretty much Mortal Kombat versions of DC. Mm-hmm. Um, Same studio. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the one game that actually took me by surprise was the Spider-Man game. <laughs> yes. That was good. That that, that was that was good. Yeah. <laughs> um, Honestly, like it, visually amazing stories are really amazing, and dealing with the Sinister Six spoiler, um, and being an open world, it was actually really cool. Like, I don't like they know I don't say anything really nice about Spider Man, so that's probably like one of the few <laughs> things I will say. <laughs> <laughs> Those games were fun. Yeah, they were. But, and then I missed an opportunity to say like a really good show. We used the DC app. I'd say Harley Quinn with um, so Kaylee Cuoco. Like Kelly Cuoco, yeah, from Big Bang Theory, yep. Yeah, <laughs> she uh, produces it, she plays Harley, and honestly, it's probably one of the most amazing animated shows I've seen in a while. I gotta check it out. It's I not a it shit at all. Like, first 30 seconds, she says fuck probably like 10 times, and then blows out some guy's kneecaps. I'm like, the fuck am I watching? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't care, but I love it. Yeah, but what was crazy, Thea's sitting next to me, I'm like, cool, this will be a cool show for us to watch. No, no, I'm like <laughs> Your your muffs. Your muffs. <laughs> Too late. She already said it. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> like, yeah, like they, there's a lot that each each company's doing that really is kinda cool right now. Mm-hmm. 
But, I love that they're doing like a relationship between her and Poison Ivy. Yeah, and it actually <laughs> just started uh, last episode. I didn't watch this week's episode. Okay. It pretty much was the. I thought it was going to be season finale. They do this like every so often. Like they pretty much the 7th, 8th through 13th, it makes it seem like it's a season finale. Mm. They like, music like it's a season finale, and all of a sudden it's like something big, and then they're like, oh, by the way, next episode. I'm like, that's a season finale ender. <laughs> And I'm like nice. the jokes they use are based upon um, the movies themselves, other TV shows, even some stuff they actually threw in the comics. So like they make fun of Bane a lot in <laughs> the first season and the second season because of his voice and it's a lot of stuff like that. Like, even like little jokes about the bat, the shark repellent and And then they actually, it looks like whoever was doing this, like, writing for the show actually did the research on everything. Mm-hmm. Can't say anything, like, really bad about it. I'll have to check but, it out. I need to check it out. Two big things that stick out. <laughs> I don't play a whole lot of games, and I don't really know too many other teams. <laughs> shows or nothing i did see the first couple episodes of harley quinn i enjoyed them uh the arkham games of course when i was playing playstation 3 they they were go-to easily um i like arkham city probably the most okay um i'm trying to think as far as like a DC animated movie that I like. Uh, I gotta go with uh, Dark Knight Returns. It was actually voiced by Peter Weller, who mm-hmm. played Robocop. I thought he yeah. like fit perfectly for old Batman. The old but Batman, I definitely. Was, I thought he was fantastic as that character, and it's mm-hmm. kind of funny because seeing Robocop, he kind of has that like old Batman, you know, jawline going. So mm-hmm. it was like kind of see if like peter weller would actually put on the suit he could be batman you know it's that chin he needs to have the chin <laughs> but he he definitely had the voice for it uh ariel winner from modern family she did mm-hmm. a voice the new robin in it um, man, I there were a couple other people had names but i actually enjoyed that more than i did the comic book and i think it was because of hearing mm. the voices hearing the emotions because when I read the comic, I was like, eh, what's this? You know, I didn't really see the hype around it. But then mm-hmm. when I actually heard the emotion and the voice acting and the characters, I'm like, oh, okay, I get it more. It's kind of like, um, I really, enjoy, I mean, I'm a Venom fan, too. Like I said, I'm a Spider-Man fan. I'm probably even more of a Venom fan, actually. Mm-hmm. But I enjoyed the Venom movie because in the comic book, you don't hear Venom talking to Eddie. In the movie, you do, and you see how the alien and the person have that relationship. And it's just so funny because, like, the voice makes a difference. Like, a good costume makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dark Knight Returns, for sure. It has a good, compelling story. Um, Good conclusion to the Joker. The Batman-Superman fight, I think, is really good. Uh, Story itself-wise is just overall fantastic it's a mix of politics and personal demons but it all in a good way yeah um one of the more i don't want to say it was disappointing but killing joke um kind of a letdown because of those extra 20 minutes that i thought they could have utilized more and they didn't i was like what okay <laughs> um and that's just within the universe i mean yeah. Uh, I've said it before, the Batman Mask of the Phantasm. I don't think... I haven't seen any animated movie top that. Yeah. But um, I, do have, I do have another one, but uh, I think Jeff might actually say it, so... <laughs> I'm kind of curious. <laughs> oh. What, what is Jeff thinking? <laughs> so, I'll, I'll jump in before Colin can get that out. Uh, we'll do the three recommendations since everyone's still at home. And... <laughs> Colin has already said, what, one? No, two, everyone. We'll save the third. Maybe we both will say it. And then we'll say 
Um, what movie we didn't like out of the, the now animated movies? So um, I'll go first so I can get this out of the way. Uh, the three that I'm going to say are the Batman vs. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Odd as it is, it is literally my childhood, well, our childhood, kind of coming together. So, like, you're getting Kevin Conroy and to come back as Batman, and then you're he's facing Shredder and ultimately doing that battle. But Mark Hamill and Tara Strong are Harley and Joker, so it's kind of cool hearing their voices. Um, I can't name any of the people who've done the Turtles, but I know their voices, so they actually mm. brought some of them back to do their voices. So it is, they're trying to do it all together. Um, the Turtles end up fighting Batman, thinking he works for the Shredder, but then they mm. come out that the Shredder is the villain. He's working for Ra's al Ghul, and they're, both, they're all trying to destroy Gotham City so that Shredder can get a hold of the uh, Joker toxin. Okay. Like, it's cool. They set it up for a sequel. It kind of falls the line of uh, Ninja Turtles 2 where uh, Super Shredder and that Super Shredder. That's how the movie ends. Like, they blow up Ace Chemicals and Shredder dies. And then at the end, <laughs> it comes out and has like the Joker color. I'm like, cool, I can't wait for the second movie or comic series. Yeah. But the other two kind of go hand in hand. So, 60s Batman, uh, Return of the Cape Crusader is the first movie, and the second movie is actually Batman Two Face. It uh, is Adam West's last movie. Uh, it shows how Two Face during the '60s Batman era would have been made. It was cool. He's voiced by um, Wow, I just drew a blank. William on Shatner. Yeah, I was say Kirk. <laughs> <laughs> Kirk. But it's cool hearing their voices come through as an animated movie. I was happy to see them bring it back, and I was happy to see Adam West to do it at least two more times before his death. Like, And then uh, uh, they both stories were really good. Out of, uh, I would say, weakest movies? That's kind of hard to say. Like, There's really not too many that I can think of off the top of my head that I'm like, oh, this is kind of shitty. But, yeah. I really can't think of anything like that's really bad. Like, there's two minutes in Killing Joke that are unnecessary. I could yeah. we'll talk about movie and anime movies, so... Uh, did I name one of the ones that you were talking about? No. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> I'll let you finish now. <laughs> uh, I was going to say Batman Beyond Return of the Joker. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah. That's a good one. That's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> Alright. Uh, Alright, Brian. But yeah, um... Anime movies, I'm trying to think... Um, I really enjoyed Reign of the Supermen. I thought that was a really great story, and then it was great to see like a because uh, you know I'm all about we're all about Batman, but it was great to see like a different take on the Superman lore, and I thought that was a great animated movie that was done. I saw it last year, amazing. Um, obviously, can't you know recommend Mask of Phantasm enough, but yeah, Return of the Joker. For Batman Beyond, that actually is on my list too of recommendations. I actually think that's a great story. It's great seeing Batman, older Batman. It's really great seeing him. Um, in terms of weakest, recently saw Batman Ninja, not too long ago. Um, I'm just gonna flat out say this: I didn't like it. <laughs> the the um, the last 30 minutes, I swear to God, it felt like a giant Michael Bay explosion. Just just one big Transformer sequence after another. And if you see the movie, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about in the last 30 minutes of this movie. I never saw an anime movie start out with so much promise and then just go south so fast. Like, you have this idea, because, like, Batman is kind of everywhere, because they have this idea of, like, Batman Gotham by Gaslight, where he's inspired by Jack the Ripper. Like, you know, Batman existing in, like, 1800s England. That's a, okay, cool concept, all right? Put Batman in these different time periods. I enjoyed that. And Batman Ninja, I thought, was going to be, like, groundbreaking when I first saw this idea of the costume and the katanas and the idea that basically all these characters now exist in Imperial Japan. That sounds really awesome. I, I was expecting to see, like, there's probably going to be some anime thrown in there. I didn't know what to think of this movie after I, after I ended it. I'm like, you know what, I'm just going to flat out say I didn't like it. 
there are things I enjoyed, but I gotta be honest, I was so massively let down by that movie because it just felt like a giant Power Rangers segment or a Transformers movie. Like, this isn't Batman. Guys. No. <laughs> that That's all I can say is just, just, just no. <laughs> Ugh. God. <laughs> Boy, I mean, at least you can skip the first 20 minutes of Killing Joke and still enjoy it, but... Yeah, I, I mean, at least overall, I enjoyed Killing Joke, even though the 20, first twenty minutes are unnecessary. I, it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't Batman Ninja. <sighs> yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Drugs and Batman Ninja go hand in hand for enjoyment. <laughs> I, I think I remember texting you guys saying, "Guys, I don't know what to think of this." <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> Yeah, I think the best thing we got out of that movie was the uh, sword fight between Joker and Batman. That was it. That was cool. Yeah. I, but, like, the fact that they were, like, their own living buildings and they... The, the villains that they tried to display were the ones I didn't want to see. Like, Deathstroke. Why didn't we get more Deathstroke in this world? We didn't. It was, like, more penguin centered and like poison ivy centered even though joker is the main baddie and then there's these other villains that are thrown in and just like who made this <laughs> what the fuck who made this movie <laughs> it, it, i think it's on the shelf you only find out i can <laughs> <laughs> no. i can't talk about that movie anymore <laughs> Ugh. It's just like... <laughs> Ugh. Ugh. Yeah. Uh, Sorry to end on a low note, but... Like, yeah, we were having a good time. We all were having... So you brought that movie up. And... Hey, you talked about movies that were disappointing, and like that was a disappointment movie for me. I think it was all of our disappointing movies that we didn't. It was in our subconscious. I just happened to bring it out in the open. It's like a bad memory. You just like, <laughs> oh yeah, by the way. And I can't think yeah. of one that made me angry, but I definitely left Batman Ninja like <laughs> no, nah, never again. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if this is an animated movie, but I would like to see Kingdom Come eventually as an animated movie. That's probably the greatest graphic novel I've ever read in my life. And I feel like if there are if Warner Brothers continues to make, you know, like hit after hit with these live action movies, that's the zenith. The zenith of this entire franchise, I feel like should be Kingdom Come. Well, I was thinking, I remember when uh, Batman Begins came out and right before the Dark Knight, there was a, a I think it was called Batman Gotham Knights. It was a series of animated shorts that led up to Batman Begins. It was supposed to be like, I mean, uh, it was it led up to the Dark Knight. It was supposed to be like a, an in-between of Batman Begins and the Dark Knight. And mm -hmm. most of it really wasn't. I think there was like one or two segments that maybe kind of could have been like that but i think that would have been cool if there are some movies or shows or like i mean like it would work perfectly for star wars if they used animated movies to tell in between stuff mm -hmm. but then it's kind of like less of a risk with a budget you still get like popcorn entertainment some fun action and it's drawing and if it tells the story and moves it along you've got something a little more visually instead of just words anymore or the what if what could be like mm -hmm. i like i know like we've all talked about how we were actually really all disappointed with everything star wars pretty much after force awakens and i actually like some of the Last old Jedi. 
um, Han Solo and Leia having the twins and Luke marrying Mara J. That I still think maybe they should do that as animated movies instead. And that would be more of. Um, I mean, not. <laughs> 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 Jeff's just shaking his head. Probably be better, at least. <laughs> we're, we're all just hoping that The Mandalorian Season 2 is good. Because <laughs> th- 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 this is all we have to look forward to right now in terms of the Star Wars universe. Just, just, just don't ruin The Mandalorian. Just don't ruin it. <laughs> Disney's got a bad sequel streak, so... Have you seen their straight to DVD movies? That's (laughs) proof in itself. I don't want (laughs) that. Anybody owning Disney Plus can watch them. They're all there. They're all there. I don't want to see them. (laughs) I'd rather watch Showgirls again. No, no one wants to watch. What a scene, man. Who the fuck? <laughs> because of the tits. Whoa, tits. <laughs> that brings me to another thing. <laughs> but seriously. Which brings me to my next point. <laughs> He's speechless. <laughs> I'm going to end this before it ends up just screaming. So... <laughs> So, like, as as a bunch of, I would say, DC fanboys, as we really are, we did actually say some nice things about Marvel. And it was kind of surprising. Like, I, I'm i still impressed at the fact that we could say something really nice about Marvel. Like, I'm not saying they're bad movies. I'm not saying that, like, they're amazing movies on both sides of the field. It, Marvel and DC are always going to be here, but it's not going to be always going to be amazing. I would say DC, I would always choose because I like the characters. Marvel does have some memorable characters. Look at uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. Probably, I think, the most underrated but best movie they have. Not their sequel, but the original one because there's so much stuff we threw in there and it was a fun movie to watch. It's probably why James Gunn should be doing the uh, uh, Suicide Squad. But Yeah, it's in the can. <laughs> yeah, and then there's so much more that was coming out that we'll find out whether or not if it's going to be good. Like I'm excited for the Snyder Cut. I'm excited to see if it, but I'm also nervous. So we'll see what is going on. <laughs> Hi, Lexi. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll see how that's going to play out. If it actually does it justice or if it actually is going to be another bomb. Um, I mean, like, you talked about director's cuts. Do we really need a director's cut of Black Panther? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> they already have two versions of Lion King out. I don't think they need the third. And <laughs> they cut out the part where they raised the Chala over the cliff. It would have been more fun, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Little baby Chathala. <laughs> oh, my God. But Warner Brothers has that major issue of doing director's cuts. We don't need it. If it doesn't help the story, you might as well just put it all out there. I mean, had me bitch about fucking Batman vs. Superman in a half hour that was cut out. It's what it is. It's That's the problem. That's why movies are going to go south. It, see, Warner Brothers needs to stop. <laughs> it's like literally wondering why my foot hurts and then discovering that you shot yourself in the foot. You were pausing it yourself. <laughs> I'm surprised they have any foot left. <laughs> the old guys, they don't. They're hobbling. <laughs> hobbling to whatever job is <laughs> willing to show them a door. <laughs> Bad thing is they did have some interesting ideas for projects in the past. Like I know people make fun of uh, the, um, Su- Superman Lives because mm-hmm. they're it was going to be Tim Burton um, with a Kevin Smith written movie starring Nicolas Cage. but The greatest <laughs> actor ever. But there's a really good documentary called uh, The Death of Superman Lives. And 
the production artwork and value and even like the the drive that Tim Burton had for trying to make that movie and make it really good how they became so close to actually filming it it, it actually sounded really interesting in the end I mean we hear the the, the obvious stuff where you go what this is going to be a fucking disaster mm-hmm. but then you add like the visuals that I saw and hearing how driven Tim Burton and even the other crew people were. I mean, they were so driven to make a good Superman movie. And especially, they showed a, a visual effect of Nicolas Cage like doing a, a high jump and flying. It looked better than some CGI today. And they said they didn't know if that was going to work. Mm-hmm. And that was test footage. And some of the images of Superman that look like the costume is totally not his costume was just like test footage they all test not, footage they, yeah. it had like a blue blue and red s they said that was not even intended to be in the movie it was just mm-hmm. another little something to say like okay he, this is nick cage in the costume he Plus, looks like christian he's bale on, christian bale put on the batman forever outfit for a test run so yeah. that's just what they do mm-hmm. and they just got out and people thought oh my god this is part of the movie it's like a classic example of the internet losing its shit when they see something that screams bad. <laughs> like, we now, all jump to these conclusions to fight over something right away, and it's like, yo, listen, until it's official, mm-hmm. then, oh, okay. But, I mean, I felt like when I first saw the Batmobile for Batman Begins, I remember clicking and, like, Xing out of the picture because I was like, why does this tank keep popping up when I'm clicking on the Batmobile? <laughs> <laughs> I must have clicked on it like six times or four. I'm like, where the hell's the Batmobile? Until I finally said, "Get it in your head." <laughs> and, and I'm like, okay, well, it's an origin, so I kind of get. It. Let's make it a little more Batmany. But then you see the movie, and you're like, dude, this could probably be the best Batmobile ever. <laughs> yeah. You don't want, like, a futuristic sex toy like in Batman and Robin? Dude, you why, why did you have to bring it up? Oh, my God. <laughs> bad movies, you know? Hey, this is what I get for watching a full week of bad movies. You get what you fucking deserve. <laughs> you did a Joker quote. Oh, my God. <laughs> See what you did? See what he did? <laughs> Oh man! I think the best thing to come out of Batman and Robin was probably the Arnold quotes, and those aren't even amazing. <laughs> no, they're not amazing. No, if there's one good thing we have to thank that movie for is that we got an eight-year hiatus and we got Batman Begins and we got the Dark Knight trilogy. So you know, thank God for that. <laughs> I've said it before. I'll say it a hundred times. We got Uma Thurman looking sexy in that movie. It doesn't help that movie. It can't save the movie. Not even Arnold Schwarzenegger's 2,000 puns. <laughs> I'm sure he had 2,000 more that were scripted but were never spoken. Probably in B roll. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. Robin, the director's cut. <laughs> no, no, that doesn't exist. No, no, no. <laughs> There'll just, be a bonus feature. It's just Arnold with an audio track just reading on. <laughs> God, just like Batman uh, Triumphant. It doesn't exist. Yo, yo, what if Arnold would have said, What's wrong, Batman? You look a little cold. Oh my God. No. No, don't start this. <laughs> don't. Don't. No. No, 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 no. <laughs> Everybody else talks about the nipples on the bat suit, so hey, you might as well point it out. Ah, get it pointed out. <laughs> Dude. That's so bad. So punny and everything. <laughs> I'm rip my hair out, dude. <laughs> did that did that last joke leave you cold? You're asking for a death sentence right now, man. Yeah, I feel like you guys are getting a little heated. Anyway, <laughs> I didn't freeze up. I was just staring at you until you said something. Uh, would you say this concludes our episode? 
<laughs> so you had to end it on a low note. Thanks, Let's Dick. Go. Oh my god, how are we gonna okay, high note, high note. Um Fuck yeah, Batman. <laughs> Julius Newmar, Haley Atwell, Uma Thurman, um, Michelle Pfeiffer. Michelle Pfeiffer. Anne Hathaway. Oh yeah, Anne Hathaway. Uh-huh. Yeah. Carl Johansson. Uh, Tom Hardy is Bane. So you came back <laughs> to die with your city. Tom Hardy is Venom. <laughs> Tom Hardy is Venom. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I got a parasite in me. Oh. Here you go, Jeff. Batfleck. Actually, no, a more appropriate one would have been like, like a turd in the wind. <laughs> I love that line. <laughs> <sighs> On yeah, that note. <laughs> I like comic book movies for everybody. <laughs> You're either going to love us or you're going to hate us after this episode. <laughs> Listen, if anybody wants to argue about uh, Black Panther, you can find me on Facebook. I <laughs> about Black Panther. You can find all of us there, and you, they'll direct you back to me so I can argue about Black Panther being a bad movie. So, <laughs> And then below it'll just say, in, in large caps, Jeff saying, quote, come at me. <laughs> You'll have to find me on Twitter and Instagram. I got suspended from Facebook. <laughs> hey, I did bring you on Facebook for that one image. <laughs> <laughs> your reaction to the poster of Batman and Robin just laughing your ass. I'm like, God, I brought you back on Facebook. And they let you back on. <laughs> <laughs> well, where there's a will, there's a way. It's funny they saw that and said, didn't we kick this kid off for saying National Prayer Day was a good thing? Yeah, you did, but Batman and Robin brought me back. <laughs> the only good thing about that movie, apparently. Seriously. <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> On that note, <laughs> before we get too far off the rails... <laughs> Uh, I do want to say, because Jeff brought up about comic book movies for everybody, that uh, I feel like they are for everybody. They're, you know, especially because in this day and age, we do get big in diversities and, you know, we don't have enough strong female characters. And the three of us have always enjoyed strong female characters. We, have, we were actually talking about it um, before the show that, you know, there's actually a lot of female characters and actresses that we admire that were really badass and um you don't see it a whole lot maybe it's just their choosings but i think the thing about comic book movies is they do let women spread their wings more in the film business and say yo you know like scarlett johansson can play a real kick-ass character and you know Haley atwell was also like awesome as agent carter uh and hathaway was a phenomenal cat woman so um you know, and then also um, different cultural characters, too. You know, I mean, it's been pretty Caucasian for the most part, but we're being yeah. open to spreading it. And I mean, I'm open to it. I mean, in the end, it's to me, we're all yeah. people. You know, it's just we're all born from different cultures. And, yeah. you know, it, skin color means nothing to me. It's it's yeah. all about morals. You know, and how you want to associate yourself. So, really yeah. But to make, but to make them a hero, especially if like there are you know racists out there, I think it's cool. It's almost like an overcoming thing. Like how you know, certain heroes do overcome stuff, and I think it's really cool that comic book characters can do that. We're not just fans, but we're inspiration as well. I have two cents. So, you guys have anything else to add? No, I'm good. All right, awesome. I guess we'll wrap things up. Yeah. Till next time, guys. This is Colin Peters. John Rochetter. Jeff Manfred. Stay safe, stay healthy, and most importantly, stay crazy, y'all. Stay yeah. crazy. Uh, please, somebody help me.